Good morning again. How's everybody doing? Like that uh, video, I call it a bumper. I like that bumper a lot. It's very, very nice with the, with the landscapes and all that's really, really great. You know what's not on there? Houses. Like any place to live. It's just people wandering out in the, in the wilderness, right? Houses are, are, are important, right? Important to find a place to live. And what I think is cool about buying a new house is that unless you're buying a brand new house, you have to do a little bit of a remodel. You gotta change some things that are there or you can, I guess, knock the thing down and start all over again. But on the whole, there's gonna be some things that you gotta buy and you're gonna say, well, uh, I need to change that. I know when, when Kim and I bought our house, uh, our house was built in the 50s and I'm confident that the windows we had were original. And I know this because you could breathe and see your breath go right through the glass. It was that thin. And so we had to do some remodel. We had to get some new windows. We had to, to get some, uh, some pipes done, all sorts of stuff. But, but remodeling is important. Things fall into disuse and disrepair and they have to be updated. And I think one of the words that needs to be updated, needs a remodel in our language, is the word friend. Friend has kind of fallen into a state, kind of like love has fallen into a state. Like I use the same word to describe that I love potato chips as I do. I love my wife and kids, right? And it's in that order too, potato chips and wife and kids. Like is that, that's the way we, we, we get passionate about things, right? I love them. Friendship is another word like that. We call people friend that, that we don't really know much about, right? This is my friend from work and you don't know anything about them, Right? This is my friend on Facebook, and I haven't talked to them in 10 years. If I don't remember your name, I'm like, hey, friend, how's it going? I'm sorry if I've greeted any of you as friend over the past few weeks. I've got a whole host of other words, too. Don't worry. I won't run out. Friend. It's a word that we don't really know what it means. It's kind of fallen into a sense of meaninglessness. We're walking through a, a series called uh, 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 All Things New, and today we're talking about new friendships. We need to remodel, we need to repair this word friendship. And today we're going to talk about that by looking at Philippians 2, 19 through 30 and ask ourselves, what should we look for in a friend? What kind of person should I be to be a friend? We're going to see that a friend builds up and a friend tears down. So let's talk about the kind of friend that builds up. A friend builds up. Now this is a fascinating portion of scripture and what I love about it is you kind of get a window into who Paul is. Kind of get to see who he is as a person because by learning about a friend you learn about a person and so here he's talking about Timothy and Epaphroditus, two of his big friends and Paul talks about Timothy as a friend who builds him up. A friend who builds him up. Now what do I mean by building somebody up? Now when I bought our house our house was, um, when we bought our house, our house was, uh, as I said, it, was, it needed some remodeling done, but it was a flipped house. And I don't know if this is the case with all houses that get flipped, but in our case, it was a house that was foreclosed on and it had fallen in disrepair and a company came in, bought it, sought to make a profit and so they made a lot of cosmetic changes, but a lot of the more detailed things that, that were really important, they neglected to do because you couldn't see them. So things like pipes, that are important for a house to function well. They decided that rusted out pipes were good enough. They were not. And we spent money to repair those, right? The windows, as I said, needed some work. There were some issues in some other areas of the house we really had to work on. Sometimes when we talk about building another person up, we're trying to flip them. And what I mean by that is we're trying to encourage them and move them on in their day so that we can get on to what we're doing. Building somebody up is not flipping them and getting them on with their day. No, building them up is not overinflating somebody. It's not telling them that, oh, you're really, really good at this, and they're really, really not good at that. That's not building somebody up. It's not avoiding the tough topics and the difficult subjects. Having to say, hey, I've I, I got to sit down with you. You're really messing this up, and I really need to speak with you about it. It's not agreeing with them no matter what. We've all maybe had those friends that expected you to just tacitly agree with everything they said. And when you didn't, they kind of rejected you. Friendship over. That's not what building somebody up is. So what is it? Well, let's talk about the four things that Timothy and Paul have in their friendship that describe how they build one another up, how Timothy builds them up. One, Timothy has something. He has something. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him. 
Now you might laugh at the idea that all I said here was something. Like, wow, Travis, you worked really hard on this one this week, clearly. But it makes sense when you understand what Paul's talking about. There is something about Paul's relationship with Timothy. He has nobody like him. And so he's saying, if I can't come myself, if I can't join you, because he's in uh, in a Roman jail, he's under house arrest, he can't go to Philippi to see them, he's saying, the next best thing is my buddy Timothy. The next best thing, if you want me, great, but Timothy's just as good. And this is why he says he is no one like him. The Greek word means equal soul. He's an equal soul. We might use the word in in sort of a platonic sort of soulmate. Uh, We also might use the word like uh, we have chemistry with one another. We just click. He gets me. We use language like that to describe a relationship where you don't really have to work at it. It just flows naturally. It, It makes sense. You guys get along. You're like peas in a pod, right? It's chemistry. And Paul essentially defines this as having equal heart, equal soul. So much so that it later on says they're like father and son. That's how close they are. And so it should be obvious why this builds somebody up. How nice is it to be around somebody that gets you? I don't have to worry about what I'm going to say or, or if I'm going to offend somebody. I'm not to worry about walking on eggshells or being misunderstood or having something that I say be repeated in the wrong light or the wrong context. I don't have to worry about that. I'm equal soul with this person. They get me. They understand where I'm coming from. I don't have to apologize that much. And if I do, it's accepted graciously. You don't walk on eggshells. I don't have to tell myself to breathe. My body does it on its own. And if I stop breathing intentionally, my body will not let me do that. Unfortunately, with cookies, I have to tell my body, Travis, put the cookie down. There's not an involuntary cookie putter downer in my body. And that's what it's like being with a good friend. It's like breathing. It just flows naturally. But now Paul, after he talks about something, this kind of abstract, sort of ethereal sort of thing, he now talks about a more concrete discussion. He cares about what Paul cares about. A good friend, a friend that builds you up, will care about what you care about. Verse 20, again, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Now, Timothy is concerned about the Philippian church. Why? He's a good pastor. That's part of it, sure. He loves the church of Jesus because he loves Jesus. Yeah. But one of the reasons why he loves the Philippian church is because Paul loves the Philippian church. We talk about this thing each week. Paul loves the Philippian church. They're his like favorite people in the whole world. And so because Paul is affectionate towards them and they have been affectionate towards Paul, Timothy has a soft spot in his heart for him. He cares about them because Paul cares about them. If you have a friend that builds you up, they're going to care about the same things that you care about. Not necessarily your interests, but they're going to care about maybe have the same values, maybe have the same things that are important. You believe things are important to the same degree. And if you do have differing interests, they encourage you in the pursuit of those interests. My best friend does woodworking. I do not do woodworking. You can come feel my hands. They are smooth as eggs. I do not woodwork. I don't like splinters. But my buddy does. And every time I go to his house, I wind up inevitably in his garage looking at some new thing he's built, some new piece of equipment that he's bought, or sometimes I'm helping him, like move a piece of equipment. And I know I'm going to get woodworking talk. I'm going to get shop talk, quite literally. And it doesn't bother me because he cares about it. He lights up. He comes to life talking about pieces of wood. I'm like, what's the difference between pine and ash again? I don't know. But he loves it. And so now when I see things on the internet, which doesn't happen often because the algorithm knows I don't like woodworking, but every once in a while I see it and I'm like, hey, have you seen this thing about woodworking? Good friends, friends that build you up, encourage you to pursue the things that give you life, that lead to flourishing. But it's not just that. It's not just like, hey, you like golf, go play golf, like to the exclusion of it. No, no, no. How can you use what you do to give God glory? A friend that builds you up is gonna recognize the things you're good at, recognize the things you're interested in and say, hey, how can you use that for the glory of God? How can you use that to care for other people? How can you use that to help your family? How can you use that to bring glory to God? They don't just stop at like, oh, that's good for you, that's fun. They push you even further than that. That's what a true friend does. But it's not just about caring about what you care about. It's also about 
caring for other people, not caring so much about themselves. They care less about themselves. Look at verse 21. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, I love this verse. And the reason why I love it is I feel like Paul kind of slips into like a dramatic teenager at this point. Because he's like, oh, everybody just cares about their own interests. He's so dramatic. It was really funny. Obviously, he's speaking hyperbolically. Like, like, there is no way he's being serious. Because he's about to go talk about Epaphroditus in the next paragraph, who almost dies for the sake of the gospel. And Epaphroditus is carrying this letter. He's going to hear it being read. And I'm sure he reads that and like, really, Paul? I almost died. And I don't care about Jesus? Like, really? But he's clearly speaking like an extreme language here. Because Timothy cares so much about what's going on. He cares about the church of Christ. Friends build, them, uh, build you up. They're, they're not going to look out just for their own interests. Yeah, they care about other people, but it's so much more significant than that. They care about the things of Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, the friend that builds you up is going to care about the things of Jesus. They're going to build you towards following Christ. So the things that break Jesus' heart are going to break their heart. The thing that, that excites Jesus, makes him happy, they're going to excite that person. They're going to push you, push you towards it. They care about honoring Jesus with their time, with their life, with their resources, and they push you to do the same. And what's really great about friends like this, and this is why they're so hard to find, is they don't make you feel like they're holier than thou because they're doing it. They don't make you feel like they're on a pedestal. In fact, you feel like it's somewhat attainable. You're like, wow, like the spirit of God just really works in this person. And he can do that in me too. You begin to believe more in who Christ is because of this person because they don't care so much about themselves. So the people that are around you, do they care about themselves? Are they focused on themselves? Are they focused on other people? Do they make the conversation about them? Do they orient life around them or are they oriented to the lives of other people? The simple truth is this. The friends you have will never build you up more than they themselves are built up. They're never gonna take you farther than they already are. And the same goes for you as well. You are never gonna contribute to the lives of your friends more than your life is already built up. Now that doesn't mean you you cut them out of your lives. That's not what I mean at all. You don't look at that person and be like, well, you're holding me back. No, 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 no. They just take on a different role. They're no longer this friend that you're expecting to be built up by. They become this friend that maybe you need to build up. You need to pour into them. It becomes less of a mutual relationship at that point. And then the last thing a friend does that build, to build you up is they repeat it. Verse 22. Verse 22. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. Paul says that Timothy has proven himself. We've always had this special relationship, Paul and Timothy. They've always been close, best friends. He's cared about the things I've cared about. He's cared about him, uh, other people and the things of Christ more than he's cared about himself. And he hasn't done it just once. He hasn't done it just twice. He's done it again and again and again and again and again. And the people that build you up, there's an expression, right? Rome wasn't built in a day. You as a follower of Christ, you as a person to be fully formed the way that God wants you to be, or you're not gonna be built in a day. It's just not how it works. And so the people that you surround yourself with, the people that you're counting on to to build you up, they've got to do the work day in and day out, day in and day out. They can't just cut and run at the first sign of trouble. They can't just be there for the good times or be there for the bad times and leave during the good times. Some friends like that too. I don't understand it, but people are like that. They've got to be consistently there, a part of your life. And here's the thing. We can all sit here and lament the fact that we don't have more people like that in our lives. And I think every one of us can. If you have one friend like that, you want more. If you have five friends like that, you want more. If you have no friends like that, you want one. But we need to recognize that we need to be that kind of friend too. We need to be the kind of friend that has a certain something about us. That leads us to to care about the interest of other people. That that leads us to not care so much for ourselves. And to be able to repeat that again and again. And you're not going to do that under your own strength. You've got to have the spirit of Christ working inside of you. I can muster interest in something I care nothing about for like five minutes. Anything more than that, especially repeated. Like, sorry, the spirit of God's got to do some work here. And it's the same for us. We have to trust in the spirit to make us the kind of friend that we all want to be. Otherwise, we'll be, well, we won't be the kind of friend that builds people up. 
Be that kind of friend. And so if Timothy's a builder, we don't just need builders, we also need people to do demolitions. We need demolitions. So a friend, a good friend builds up, but a good friend also tears down. So when you're remodeling a house, if you're doing any kind of construction, if you want people to help you, promise them the opportunity to do demolitions. They will join you. Oh, I get to swing a sledgehammer? Awesome. I get to use a crowbar? Great. Let me, I'll help you. And then leave after the demolition part is done. Because again, smooth hands. People love doing demolitions. And it's funny because sacrifice is critical. If you're going to remodel anything, you have to have, you have to take things away. You've got to sacrifice. You can't keep everything. You've got to move things out to bring in uh, the new things, right? And usually when I speak to you and when we spend time together, I, I, we look at the passage of Scripture and then we make, make uh, decisions out of it. We, we kind of extrapolate from the text, right? Today I want to be very clear about something. What do I mean by tearing down? What do I mean by a good friend tears down? Because many of us have friends that are like demolitions experts, only they tear us down. They're especially good at ripping us apart, right? This was my group of friends in high school. We were like just vicious with each other. I don't know that it was that healthy, but that's the way we were. And we're still friends actually to this day. Maybe not the best of friends, but it works. We all have friends in our lives that tear us down. But the kind of friend that you want in your life is the kind of friend that tears themselves down to build into you. That removes from their opportunity, their lives, their passions to build into you. That's what a good friend does. And, and again, it doesn't mean they can't criticize you. It doesn't mean they can't uh, uh, bring up certain points of concern. That's different than tearing you down. So when I say tear down, we demolish ourselves. We, we sacrifice from ourselves to build into the lives of other people. And this is why Paul starts talking about Epaphroditus because apparently this man was passionate about tearing himself down. Look at verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. This dude has five descriptors. Brother, worker, soldier, messenger, and minister. And all of these roles are sacrificial roles. If you want to be good at any of these roles, you have to be somebody willing to sacrifice, tear down from yourself to build into the lives of other people. So to be a good brother, what do you have to do? You have to sacrifice to look out for your siblings. You can't always put yourself first. To be a good worker, you have to sacrifice your time and your energy and your talents for a project. You've got to put time and energy into it. To be a good soldier, you sacrifice your life for the mission. To be a good messenger, especially in the ancient world, you didn't get to just click send. You had to like pack a bag and travel over land or over sea with the possibility of not coming back to deliver a message. And that's what Epaphroditus was. He's the one who delivered the message that Paul is now responding to in the letter of Philippi. If there was no Epaphroditus, there would be no Philippians. He's a big deal. To be a good minister, you have to sacrifice from yourself to shepherd other people. Even when you've been wronged, even when you've been hurt. Apparently Epaphroditus was good at one thing and that was laying down his life and you got to have people in your life like this who are willing to be this and you've got to be this for other people. Do you have a friend in your life that you would describe you as a fellow brother or sister, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, a messenger, a minister? Do you have somebody you'd describe that way? Do you have a sibling in the faith, somebody who's close to you like a brother or a sister should be? that you can turn to in the midst of difficult times? Do you have a fellow worker who encourages you in the faith? Maybe you partner together in ministry together. It's one of the best things about working here. I get to work with friends, people I enjoy being with. Do you have a soldier who slogs through tough times together with you? Anybody remember the movie Forrest Gump? Bubba and Forrest, they're best friends. They slept back to back, so they didn't have to sleep with their heads in the mud. Do you have somebody to sleep back to back with so you don't have to sleep your head in the mud or do you keep just putting your head in the mud? Do you have a fellow soldier to take you through tough times? Do you have a messenger in your life, somebody who brings you the good news of Jesus Christ? When you're feeling down, they're always reliable and they're like, hey, let's talk about the gospel. Let's remember why it is that we are so hopeful despite the fact that we're despairing now. Do you have someone who ministers to your needs? You know what I think the remodels that I think are really remarkable are the ones that take something that is old 
and broken in the house and they make it a part of the new construction, right? So they'd say, oh, we really like the facade, so we just kind of updated it a little bit and it looks like it's a million years old, but they really updated it and made it look great. So I got married in Ellis Chapel. My wife and I got married over there. And uh, right shortly after it was to, uh, we got married, uh, they were doing some remodeling on Ellis Chapel. And so they took down the old cupola, you know, the dome on the top, and uh, they were going to put up a new one. And so I went to Dan Young, who's, who's in here right now, and, and he uh, was working uh, with us at the time. And I was like, hey, my anniversary is coming up, and I would love to give a piece of this church to my wife for an anniversary. And I bragged like for a month, two months to my wife. I told her, I was like, I'm going to win our anniversary which was great, great first year advice, by the way. Just brag all you can. I was convinced. And so Dan hooked me up. I thought Dan was gonna bring me like a little like piece of it. It was not small. No, 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 it was massive. It was like this wide and that tall. I was like having to carry it. I was like, I got it. He's like, you want help? I was like, I got it. And so I didn't have a place to keep it because we were in a one bedroom apartment because like where are you supposed to hide this thing? And so my woodworking buddy took it for me. And, uh, and, and, and so I presented it to my wife and I was like, hey, this is a part of the church we got married in. And so, and I was like, if you want, we can, you know, cut it up. We can do something new with it or whatever. We can remind. And she's like, no, I want to keep it just like it is. And it's now our coffee bar in our house. It's like this piece, this railing of the cupola, a part of the church that we got married in is now a part of our coffee bar. And people come and, and they get coffee from it in our house. And, and it's really cool. And what's neat about it is something that's really old is now a part of us and a part of something that's new. And we love this piece. And, and when you are a friend to somebody and you tear down out of your life, you give up opportunity, you give up resources, you give up time and energy to build into them. You know what you're doing? You're taking something that's old in yourself and you're making it a part of their remodel, their refurbished. So their success is your success. Their achievements are your achievements too. You get to share in that. Just like that part of the church is a part of our house and a part of our family now forever in the same way. You become a part of their life and a part of their story forever. That's why tearing down is important because when you tear down, you build into them. You build into them. And ultimately, the calling on us as followers of Jesus Christ is to do this again and again and again and again and again until we die. Look at what Paul says in verse 26. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So what happened was Epaphroditus apparently somehow on the journey to bring this letter from Philippi to Paul that Paul is now responding to, something happened. He either caught a bug and he got sick or he fell and got hurt or whatever, but something got happen, happened and he is now, he, he was very, very sick to the point where he almost died. And the original plan based on what you read here was for Epaphroditus to deliver this letter from Philippi and then stay with Paul to serve him while he was under house arrest. And he got so sick that Paul's like, dude, just go home. Like, you're, like you're, you need to recover. You, you can't, I love you. I, I think you'd be very useful, but you just need to go home and recover. And so Epaphroditus is now carrying this letter that we're reading now, Philippians, from Paul back there. And what Paul's saying is, look, he, he didn't fail you. He got really sick and, and you were worried. I was worried. We're all worried. He needs to come home and, and recover. You see, Epaphroditus sacrificed tore down out of his life to build somebody else up, to build Paul up. And it almost cost him his life. It almost cost him his life. How far are we willing to go to care for a friend? How much are we willing to take from our own pile of things that we have and build into the life of somebody else? Might be willing to do a nice birthday gift. Might be willing to throw a party, watch their kids every once in a while. Are you really willing to make sacrifices to build someone up? Do you have anyone you're willing to die for that doesn't share your last name? Do you have somebody like that in your life? Maybe it's agreeing to watch somebody's kids once a week while they go and pursue a higher form of education. Maybe it's rejoicing in their relationships that they're having despite the fact that you don't have one of your own. Maybe it's dipping into your vacation fund to pay their mortgage or their rent while they're unemployed. Maybe it's cooking for them once a week because you think, man, they really need to eat healthier. And they're not, and they're not taking care of themselves. 
Epaphroditus nearly dies for the sake of Christ. That's what it says. It says, verse 30, for he nearly died for the work of Christ. You know what the work of Christ was? Blessing Paul, blessing his friend. And for many of us, that's the work of Christ, is being friends to people, sacrificing to build them up. Are you willing to do that for other people? Are you willing to receive that love as well? Sometimes we struggle to do that too. We refuse to be served. So we've talked about friends that build us up. We talk about friends uh, that tear themselves down for our sake. And there's somebody, obviously, who should jump off the page here that does this perfectly. That's the Lord. The Lord does this perfectly. I think one of the clearest signs that we are, we, we've lost the meaning of friendship is that when I tell you that you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're in a relationship with Christ, if I tell you that and I tell you that you're a friend of Jesus, it seems to resonate very little with us. If you come into my office, let's say you're going through a hard time, you're struggling with something and you, you, you sit on, in one of my chairs and, and you tell me you're, you're sitting there crying and I, and I come and sit next to you and I say, hey, it's gonna be okay because Jesus is your friend. I'll be honest, I think more of you would probably get your head stuck back in the back of your head with an eye roll than you would with like exclaiming praise because we don't know what to do with Jesus as a friend. I, I'll be honest, I don't. Jesus is your friend sounds maybe campy or cheesy. Why am I more comfortable with Jesus as my Lord, my boss, than I am with Jesus as my friend? Why am I more comfortable with that? My guess is I understand what a boss does. Maybe because I understand what a savior does. But maybe I don't understand what a friend is supposed to do. Is a friend just supposed to be a peer? Because I'm not a peer with Jesus. We're not on the same level. But here's what you need to know. One, we're never going to know real friendship as followers of Jesus Christ if we don't begin to look at what a friend does by looking at Christ and letting him change our lives and being friends with him first. But also looking at Christ and seeing him as the ultimate friend. And based on this passage, and what we're going to do right now, we're just going to walk through this passage again real quick. We're going to get five things that Timothy and Epaphroditus are described as doing or being and see how Christ does them even better than they do it. One, there's no one like him. Go back to verse 20. For I have no one like him. Paul said that probably, again, hyperbolically. But there's nobody like Jesus Christ. Perfect in holiness and righteousness and justice, but also perfect in grace and love. And we just sang, I will arise and go to Jesus. And if you listen to the lyrics, the lyrics are, come ye sinners. Come you failures, you're broken. And Jesus is perfect, he will embrace me in his arms. I love that song. Because it's usually what I need to hear the most. That Jesus is gonna embrace me despite my failings. Despite how I've messed up. And the cool thing about Jesus, he never changes. We all have friends that you never know what you're gonna get out of them, right? Sometimes they're in the best mood ever and sometimes they're not in the best mood ever. and They're like the worst mood ever. You're like, you kind of just have to like decide five minutes in how this lunch is going to go. Jesus is never like that. Jesus is always the same. There's nobody like him. There's nobody like him. Jesus also didn't seek his own interests. Look at verse 21. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. We're memorizing Philippians 2, right? Philippians 2, 5 through 11. It's a passage of scripture they're working on talking about what Christ has done for us. It says that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. What that means is he denied himself the privileges of deity, not the, not the character of deity, but the privileges of deity. And he came to earth and he dwelt amongst us. And he suffered. He suffered for us. His own interest would, Jesus is God. He was being worshiped just fine by the heavenly host. And if he wasn't, he can create more. Here's the thing. Jesus doesn't need us. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But he wants us. He desires us. And because we are alienated by sin, because we have been separated by brokenness, he had to do something to bring us back into a relationship with him. He didn't think about our own interest. He thought about what we needed to be made whole. He says this, no man has greater love than this, 
than a man that lays down his life for his friends. You always see stories on the news, every once in a while, I guess, about uh, like a firefighter or a policeman, somebody, uh, maybe a soldier, who gave up their lives for somebody else. And what inevitably winds up happening is the person, uh, maybe they have a, a widow or they have a, a, a child that, that no longer has a parent, and that parent, that child, or that, that widow winds up having a relationship with the family of the person that was rescued, right? You see it sometimes where these sort of close bonds take shape over this loss and this sacrifice that's made. And I think part of it is because the family of the person that was rescued, they want to get to know what kind of a person would do this. What kind of a person would give up their life? And I would say the same thing to you. Find out who Jesus is. Get to know him. Shouldn't we want to know more about this guy from the Middle East that wanted to make us whole? He gave up his life for me. Shouldn't I want to know who he is and what he was about? He's so interested in me. Why am I not interested in him? Jesus has also proven his worth. Verse 22. It says, but you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father he served me in the gospel. Jesus has proven his worth. And some of you might sit here at this point and be like, Travis, Jesus hasn't proven his worth to me. Look around at the things going on in the world. Look at the struggles that we have. Look at this pandemic, all this stuff. We're all wearing masks. How's Jesus proven his worth? How, how, how is, uh, I'm going through a really dark time in my life. Jesus hasn't proven himself to me yet. Well, look, I'll say this, and I, and I can't, one, I think it's a fair response, to be honest. I understand that. And I would love to, to be able to address this apologetically and to, to get into like little details. I don't have time for that today. If you want to talk about it, you can come see me. But I would encourage you to keep going, and here's why. Because if Jesus hasn't proven himself yet, he will. He will give him time. Sometimes faith has to be the stand-in for proof. I don't have proof that Jesus was raised from the dead, but I have faith that's going to lead, lead to proof one day. Sometimes our faith has to prove, and one day you're going to wake up out of this, in the middle of this crisis that you're in. You're going to wake up and you realize that he was there the whole time, and he'd proven himself the whole time. Jesus is also with us, verse 25 I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, your messenger, and minister to my need. Jesus is with us. He's with us in the midst of everything. He's a fellow this, 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 and this. He's with us in the middle of it. Jesus didn't just come to earth, incarnated at 33, pop up on a hill outside Jerusalem and be like, all right, I need y'all to crucify me on this for the uh, sins of the world, and then I'm going to leave. No, he was born. He grew up. He had colds. He had flus. He got splinters. He did not have smooth hands. He saw people die. And he is with you in the midst of things that you are in the midst of too, by his spirit. And then the last thing is he died. Verse 30, for he nearly died for the work of Christ. Jesus actually died for the work of Christ. He died so that we could be made whole. We talked about remodel, and a remodel being great because when you, when, you get remod, when, when, when you remodel a house, you tear down something old, but you might put something new inside of it, right? Jesus tore himself down, ripped himself apart so that he could live inside of us through the power of the Holy Spirit, so he could dwell in us. The Holy Spirit living in us. So when you come to faith in Christ, when you trust him, when you come to salvation by grace through faith, the rebuild begins. The remodel takes place. Your heart becomes transformed and it's progressively transformed. You're made into a new creation. Don't look away from the opportunity that you have if you've never taken it today to be remodeled, to be changed, to have the old, old story of Jesus Christ be put into the beams and the foundation of your life and you become something new and more glorious than you could have ever imagined. You can be this by faith in him. You can become this by faith in him. Do it. Do it. Put your faith in him today. Don't miss the opportunity to do it. Because we'll never know real friendship unless we know the friendship of Christ first. Because he designed friendship. He's the one that came up with it. He knows how to do it best. Look for friends. Be a friend that builds other people up. Look for friends. Be the kind of friend that tears yourself down. And always remember Christ who tore himself down to build you up to make it where you can have a relationship with the Father for eternity. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for friendship. That you decided that it was not good for man to be alone 
And it's usually used to describe marriages and weddings, but Lord, it's also true that it's not good that we not have friends. You desire us to be in community, Lord God. So I pray that we would be in community. I pray that we would seek out friends to build us up that would tear themselves down so that the work of Christ might be accomplished in us. Lord God, we love you and we're grateful for who you are. It's in your name we pray, amen.